scoffing it. The blind man with the Wallace Beery whiskey voice keeps bawling. Mary! Angie! Tells Aunt Ella. Feel that, Brad. I gave pegs better, Brad, when I had pegs. Pennsylvania, 1918. When, says Aunt Ella? 1918. And he knocks over his glass of Pepsi. Sunflower rock. Come on, get out. You gotta get out, says Millie. Stop sleeping. Get out. I get the. I call the cop. The old man crumples up his check and drops it onto the sawdust floor. Mary, he says, and staggers to his feet and begins to come on to Mary behind the counter. She wipes the glass counter and does not meet his eyes. Says, "You'll get out now." He does, stiffening his body and pushing. It back off the counter with his arms reels lightly toward the door. See you tomorrow, Mary, and something else low. You'll get out, she says. He does. Millie, the waitress, is full of plump wrath and righteousness, finding the unpaid crumpled bill on the floor. He comes in, eats, he goes to sleep, don't even pay his bill. Millie lays the crumpled paper on the counter. I suppose there's a place to put it. Hey, he's all right. He just thinks it's a flop house. Aunt Ella joins in, having emerged from the kitchen where she is these nights, wipes her hands on her apron and grins. Sunstroke. It's Max, the customer at the front table. He was hitting the head with a sunflower. Makes the finger gesture to his own head. He sports a new pair of those half-size aluminum crutches, crippled open on the chair beside him. The circles grow from the stone. Woody, black dog with a curly tail, circles back of the counter, up front again. The missus circles up from the ovens to find out what the shouting's about. Mary circles back of the register for someone who does pay. Aunt Ella circles back to the kitchen. Another order's in. Struck in the head with a sunflower. The old man's circle has taken him out the door, into the rain. Outside... The night is full of March rain. That was the joke, some joke. The evening traffic uptown. Soon, we step, it in, step into it ourselves. Stop to buy a half pint at the corner for the cold night, for the pocket. Already wet, we turn our back to the north wind. Feel the whiskey burn. It might as well be spring. 6.15 is already dark on a winter night. In December, remember, you keep coming back like a song. In January, I said you, January. Sunset is 5.47. When I come to this country, sketch with this high, the hand. Und wird es slit yet in the side, up to here. I can't look. <laughs> Out of the steamed-up window instead, a pickup truck is cream-colored and dark avocado green in the street, streaked every few minutes or so with pale yellow headlights uptown on the avenue. The pickup truck apparently delivers instead. Out of the deli next door, a figure of a man stocks the truck, opens the door of the truck. In the window, it being night, the inside of the bakery restaurant is reflected back. The waitress is cleaning up the tables, is cleaning up the dishes, three tables back. Watch the crotch near where her hand lay to indicate the height, depth of the slit in the dress. The uniform is white, tight. It's night. The man opens the truck door and climbs into the waitress's skirt, very naturally and just below the waist. Neither one knows, but it might as well be spring. <laughs> I was reading at Robert's place tonight. I was I was reading some Ed Dorn. So let me. I think I think I'll finish the thing with this book with 
for this piece called Pre-Lenten Gestures. Thank God one tone or one set of decibels is not all there is. The DACRA, the radio behind me, is, due to the mad programmer we never know, followed by a selection of military band music. How kind. I can't help thinking of Ed Dorn, his line, why can't it be like this all the time, as my friend said. The band, the binding, the bound from one state to the next, and sometimes one is not even asked what may be revealed, given. What? Let it be revealed. A girl comes in with her little fur hat and wants to buy that cake that looks like a group of buns in the window. Impulse buying. That's what it is, a group of buns. <laughs> her young husband stands outside in his little fur hat, smiling superciliously. <laughs> Foolish little girl, said Rudolph Valentino, smiling to himself on the set as he read and pocketed the bill from his tailor. What is it called? Sugar buns, says Aunt Ella looking at the buns themselves as though she were identifying some obscure layer of geological time for a <laughs> micropaleontologist who might know better let her expression not insult the girl. 35 cents, says Aunt Ella. The girl drops a dime of the change, leaving. Her little husband in the door smiles as she bends to pick it up. Boy in a nicely shaped black coat and package of laundry, crook of his arm, who has been not quite studying the menu on the window between them, glances to his left and disappears down the avenue as the girl emerges, readjusts his bundle. Aunt Ella runs the squeegee over the length of the door. The glass steams so. It is revealed that the red blotch on the opposite curb is a Jaguar, Cap J, and the blue one behind it's a Ford, Robin's Egg Ford. Onward and upward. We used to say in the army before, trying to pick up a cluster of teenagers, these streets of San Antonio that hot, we were that hot. A small boy has started a fire in the vacant lot beyond the Jaguar and Fort Sousa, still calling the sounds from the radio at my back. I am back to an earlier question. Someone had found it strange. I should think of the concomitant physical culmination of love, fucking in short as a release, sometimes a relief from the pain of loving itself. Surcease of pain. The idea is medieval, at least. Oh, lady, give me some relief. Cure me of that sweet sickness I am subject to. Object, of course, bed. What happens to impulses from fingers that touch that smooth skin that they skim the breast down the line of ribs beneath the indentation of waist, the flare of hip, smoothness of thigh, rounding inward, past forests of night to churn among mucous membranes, heat rising. The beaky crane, the one-eyed great goose, the tower risen out of the olive grove, surcease of pain. Love, the disease that implies its own cure, part and end of it, and that end begins again. You who alone can cure me by your touch, lady, a cry they sometimes insisted was, had been addressed to the virgin, implied in its end, surcease of pain. No virgin but another hand. And that miraculous touch, his lady's fingers curled against his own, against the small of his black back, flat out. A mystery? No. What else could happen? The world is what it is, men and women what they are. Every organic thing, O oh philosophers, men plant or animal containing a seed, the flower, its own destruction, its own rebirth. Yeats was right. All true love must die, alter it the best, into some lesser thing, prove that I lie. Hardly, with O'Leary in the grave, seed of that growth, cure of that ill, and once begun the act for, tells its own whatever breaking now, its own end revealed. Squeegee drawn once more down the door's glass. 
the Jaguar gone, the Ford remains itself at last, revealed smaller now by itself, as the houses, parks, the football fields of our youth, then it, they, then seemed. It always is, always was, this way, Ed, all the time. It is not that it does not happen. It does. And there is no help for it. And there is no end to it until there is. I'll read ten minutes from this other book again. <coughs> Ritual 7. Another thing that turns me on is the subways. And I have a lot of subway poems one way and another. What is there sits anonymous in the subway and destroys our eye for anything else for ours? It is today the Eastern Mediterranean. She just sits there, dark complexion, that neat slight hook to nose, the rosebud mouth of a Persian princess, but already too full, upper and lower, and maybe the one, the fun, the great whore of Port Said or Babylon who scholarly sits there, knowing the line or the shadow one perfectly, and other shadows swinging under the cheekbones as she turns to note number or name on the station. The neat hook, the Persian, Arabian, Afghan, Indian, Pakistani, Lebanese, eyes, black, black, Egyptian, Mesopotamian, mouth, pale, pale. That stanza always makes me salivate. I don't know why. There must be something about the verb following him. She gets out of 14th Street and Union Square and speaks to a strapping old Irish woman about the change of train. A last glimpse. The local pulls out slowly, too slowly. She stands there, legs parted under the black coat of fake fur. She just stands there, endlessly, taking neither express nor local, stands there on the 14th Street platform, the whole Eastern Mediterranean history between her thighs, thinking. You were wearing a very Zen dress, he told her. <laughs> and she was the silly Hungarian. <laughs> a very Zen dress, she asked. That's right, he said, and put his hand there. <laughs> Bulgarian? No. Zenless and Isa, Garless and Isa, standing in the high, cool rooms, walking the corridor. The title of that one is called She Holds His Hand. <laughs> Lorcus. Long side burns and teeth showing, the teeth showing, seedy boy. Overcoat slack, he's back, that figure of joy. To offer the subway system and everyone on it. This 1 a.m. of April 9th, 1964. Seeds, or what it. I, they, we, need. Faces one. I'm under the subway now. That's all I can do is... <laughs> <coughs> Who in New York in 1965 would have such incredible taste as to do a little girl's hair? In long, skinny skeins of curl a la Shirley Temple, Little Miss Marker stage, the wonderful Puerto Ricans. The taste so bad, the effect is wondrous, beautiful. And so she is, a brown little waif wife, five-year-old opposite me on a Lexington Avenue train in a peppermint red and white striped dress with some legend needle pointed neatly in across the bottom of the skirt I can't read. Below, too. 
it says. She pulls it down prim, looking at me. Reproaching? Can it be? She thinks I'm looking up her dress? So I do. <laughs> Not very interesting. It's her eyes that get me. The severe quality in the reproach has already faded, reseated in favor of, my God, friendliness. A friendly reproach then from Shirley Temple. That's, that's fading away and there's a look of satisfaction. Five years old? That makes me wonder what my face looks like. <laughs> the part of the skirt she tucked between her knees pops up again. Starch, crinoline maybe? Well, it's still not very interesting. Her father finds something, though. There's a spot just above her right knee. Bruised dirt. What's that? He asks. She shrugs. He takes his hand away. The letters visible on the skirt read now, Longs to... I guess the legend now, it's incredible he can't keep his hands off her legs, lays his slender hand over her knee just as they rise to exit at Grand Central Station while I'm right, the skirt does have a crinoline, and the message reads, finally, my heart belongs to Daddy. <laughs> I'll just bet. <laughs> the curls down the back of her neck are perfect in her care not to scuff the patent leather shoes with their sad shine. She stumbles a bit at the doors. Goodbye, Shirley Templin. Goodbye, which close all at once. <coughs> the proposition. After she had complained about men nearly a solid hour, to her friend's mother. She was visiting her friend and her friend's mother in the country. Her girlfriend left the house to look for the cat, and she continued the repetitive argument which her friend's mother listened to patiently without comment until while wow, her daughter was gone out looking for the cat. And she said for the hundredth time how really awful bastards men were, and didn't she, the mother, think there was something else to be interested in, or wasn't it time to try something new, the mother, after long silence, said, it wouldn't be new to me, but I'm ready any time you are. <laughs> the girlfriend, returning with the cat, was a trifle confused when her friend in insisted she had to catch the late bus home. There was some editing she had to do. I hope she wasn't offended or anything. The mother, after having driven the girl to her bus, explained to her daughter on the way home the very probable reason her friend had left to go back to the city so suddenly. Put a couple more out fast and just uh, and uh, end the set. So who needs legs? We do. Oh, to look at all those revolutionaries, Siqueiros and Seguida and all that. Said Montagnier, I'm her Grendel. She's my damn if I have to stay here with my images. We are still all glad we have met again. Large smile. I have met two old friends in the bright sunlight and come at last to that. Gate 4, Section 11, November 28th, and a long dream, and I cannot find my way from one long street to the other, or the through streets do not run through, and the vowels make it so long. Dear labyrinth, O oh, double-bitted axe, O oh, friend, you are swinging, and how sharp you are. You keep turning, and it doesn't matter which way, or art thou still sometimes, or still, as they say, twisting? I still haven't got to the end of you. I shall never catch up, but still glad to see you. Large smile.
He's called Poor Dog. Let me just finish with it. I'll finish this set with it anyway. Out of the back window, from the Washung two stories up, water drops fall in the sun. Slant past my floor in the light breeze. The filthy trees in my mind are never chopped down, are hung with bells tinkle in the light wind. In the light, from sunlight, lowering the bucket into the deep well, hauled up again, tackle creaking, filled. With clear, cold, some water always slops from the zinc rim back, down, here. Water drops fall through the blackness, scream, splat, slop from the bucket. Bucket, lifting both hands and drink. Guzzling, holding the asses of young girls in our hands. Drinking it all in, coffee or cream or both. Both sweet remembrance of. Making it. Not a thing on our mind. The silly ass, hard drinking nights of our youth and just making it to the bathroom in time. With shit the next morning, warm shit leaking from our cracks. Fifteen years later, we still talk. All night. The day... The black cat sits in the front window looking out of our minds down into the street with glazed eyes, screaming at intervals about her cunt hole by Jeffrey, letting the males know where she is, wanting to be where the boys are, or at least down in front of McSorley, huddled, accepting their courtship, watching the flies buzz, and the dog trot sidling past on a leash, interested, not a thought on his mind, but that eager, innocent curiosity leaking out of his muzzle, his ears, his musculature as he moves past the cats, preparing to copulate. Not a thought on their minds. Sheer intention, passive, passion, action. Camera, yellow filter for bright sunlight. Their eyes glaze. They ignore him. Okay, let's break for five or ten and... We'll have a third set, shorter. I have a couple of requests that I shall try to take care of immediately. Uh, one was for some Provençal translation. So I'll read one, one piece by Guillaume de Petal, who was uh, Eleanor of Aquitaine's grandfather. And he didn't... Uh, in a way, he didn't make so much uh, uh, poems in the traditional sense as sort of after-dinner speeches for his friends. And so a lot of the... Uh, since he happens also to be the first troubadour of whom we uh, have any written record, uh, I mean, like there were doubtless troubadours for you know, a good... 500 years before him, who were, you know, singing away, too. Uh, but uh, nobody ever bothered to write it down until the Count of Poitou started, uh, like, turning out these things, and uh, they decided, well, that gave it a little class, so they would write it down. And they got them into the habit of writing it down. You know, so. And then there's another 200 years where a lot was written down. Anyway, uh, this is... Uh, called For I Un Vest Post Me Sonnel. I'll make a verse while I'm asleep here, walking and loafing in the sun. Some women play a lot of nasty games. I could name names. Women who disdain to take a night as lover. They commit a heavy mortal sin, refusing a loyal nobleman. And if they love a monk or clerk, then they are wrong. By rights, one might then use a torch to make them burn. Beyond Limousin, in the Auvergne, going along there under my cloak, alone, I met the wives of Ingari and Inbernat. They greeted me simply in the name of St. Leonard. And one said to me in her dialect, God save you, Sir Pilgrim. You seem of decent family, in my opinion. We see traveling through the world too many madmen. Now hear what I said to them. I answered neither pack nor point, nor mentioned either staff nor tool, but only said, Tarar babart mata babeli orri ben saramahart. Agnes said to Ermesane, 
we found what we were looking for. God's love, sister, let's take him in. He's as dumb as our bedroom door. <laughs> no one will ever know the tricks we used him for. One of them took me beneath her cape, brought me into their room by the fireplace. You know, that made me feel very nice, and the fire was good. And I warmed myself at the huge coals and burning wood. They had me eat a few capons and understand there were more than two. And neither cook nor scullery boys, but the three of us for supper. And the bread was white, and the wine was good, and lots of pepper. Sister, this fellow here is clever, and is holding his tongue because of us. Let's bring in our great red cat, who will make him babble soon enough if he lies in this matter. Agnes went for the ugly beast. His whiskers were long and his claws immense. I saw him among us. I was in terror. I nearly forgot that I was fearless and full of valor. When we had drunk and eaten well, I undressed myself at their request. She held behind my back that cat, vicious and cruel, and dragged him from my second rib down to my heel. She seized the cat then by the tail, swung him and clawed me. They gave me more than a hundred rips that day, but I would scarcely have budged yet if they'd killed me. Sister, said Agnes to Aramis, saying, he's real done, that much is plain. Draw him a bath, and after that we'll have some lovin'. Eight days and more they kept me there in that damned oven. Now hear how many times I fucked them, a hundred and eighty and eight times more, until I nearly broke my strap and the baggage with it. And I can't tell you how much it stung. He took so much of it. I can hardly tell you about the pain. He stood so much of it. In the tornado. At daybreak, Ned, roll off the couch. You'll carry this song in your pouch straight to the wives of Ingari and Inbernat. And tell them, see, for love of me, that they kill that cat. Oh, let me do something a little more than...